okay, so what's going on and what do I think is happening in the world of um, quantum mechanics and gravity and uh, all that sort of stuff? I actually think we're experiencing a golden age of quantum mechanics. Somehow driven by a combination of different directions, condensed matter physics, quantum information theory, gravity, computer science even, all driving what I think is really, um, I don't know what you want to call it, a revolution. We're not going to change quantum mechanics, I don't think. Well, I mean, I'm not so sure of that, but, um, but things are happening. The thing that I most <laughs> And once more, that's it, they're finished. <laughs> um, one of the things that seems to me to be happening is that the, founda the foundations of quantum mechanics, in a particular context, in the context where the objects which we're studying are black holes, which is an odd thing to think about, but you know, we can do it. In that context, it seems to me the foundations of quantum mechanics are being geometrized are being converted to statements about geometry. And statements about geometry are being converted to statements about quantum mechanics. This I find thrilling because it means that quantum mechanics and gravity are really joined in a much deeper way than, uh, than we, I think, than we ever really imagined. Entanglement, for example, we do live in an age of entanglement. Everybody talks about entanglement. Uh, I even hear it in the, uh, on the bus uh, to, to work in the morning, people talking about entanglement. Entanglement is one thing, and I think most of you know about the things which have happened in entanglement and the connection between um, entanglement and geometry. It's called the Rui Takanaki theory. Or the Yuri Ryu. Ryu. Ryu, Ryu. Ryu Takanaki theory which tells you how to calculate, um, in a field theory, how to calculate uh, the entanglement entropy by replacing it by a problem in gravity, gravitational geometry, geodesics, all that sort of stuff. That's one thing. Um, it's an incomplete uh, story. For one thing, it can't take you behind the horizons of black holes, at least not in any way we know now. Um, why should we be, oh, first of all, why should we be interested in the interior of black holes? The interior of black holes are the places which are not accessible from asymptotic boundaries, asymptotic timeline boundaries. It probably frustrates string theorists, but we live in a world which is not accessible to an asymptotic boundary. And I think until we learn to think about the world not as an S matrix, not as a set of boundary correlators. Um, we're not talking about the world that we live in. So a model for the world that we live in, I'll try to argue, is the interior of a black hole. But on the other hand, quite apart from that, it's a big piece of the problem, understanding whether there is an interior to black holes, whether the interior satisfies quantum mechanics, whether it satisfies general relativity and so forth. And as you probably know, there are questions and there is contention about it. So we need tools. We need tools of some sort. What I'm going to talk about today is the role of complexity <coughs> in the black hole interior. Um, uh, Lenny, can yeah. you say why you even question whether there's an interior? It's <laughs> great that question is you can't get into the interior. Is that <laughs> what I'm saying? Uh, why I would question? Yeah. I don't question it anymore, but that <coughs> does. Uh -huh. but well, you just said, is there mm -hmm. interior? Mm -hmm. You just said, is there interior? I'm not the only person in the world. The person as smart as Joe thinks maybe there isn't. Uh -huh. right. So we have so, to ask the question. So you're saying that's why we, we have to argue it out. We have to argue it out. We have to, but unfortunately, none of us have compelling, absolutely powerful tools that are up to the task. So we have to build. All right, now I'm going to tell you part of that building is complexity, or 
tell you what I mean by complexity in a minute. But I said the entanglement story is an incomplete description of things for the simple reason that it can't get behind the black hole horizon, at least not in ways that we know now. And um, another tool that's connected with entanglement is called, some of you know what this means, I hope you do, ER equals ETR. I'll tell you what it means exactly in a minute. This is a concoction of one model Sanger and myself. ER stands for Einstein-Rosen. Einstein-Rosen means Einstein-Rosen bridges, colloquially wormholes. EPR stands for Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, and it means entanglement. Here is a statement, here's a brief statement of what this principle means. That if you have two black holes, or if you have a pair of black holes, then there's an if and only if statement. If they are entangled, they have a wormhole between them. And that really does seem to be the case. I'm not going to make the argument, um, but let me just say that I think the situation is even stronger than that. Well, what does a wormhole mean? A wormhole means something like this. Well, OK. There's space. Here's a black hole. It has a horizon over here. It has a horizon over here. Maybe the black hole uh, sort of dips in, forming what's called an embedding diagram, forms some sort of structure like that. What a wormhole means is a connection between these two where you can go from here to here without going through the external space. Now, if anybody would have told me a year or two ago that I would be uh, thinking about uh, <coughs> wormholes, I would have said, no, I, uh, I will not think about wormholes. <laughs> I, think, um, I think we're forced to it now. OK. so. If and only if the black holes are entangled, then they will be connected by an Einstein-Rosen bridge. And what's more, if you follow the Einstein-Rosen bridge from one to the other, it's not an external space. It could be very short, even though these black holes could be a zillion miles apart. Okay, It could be very short. It's really just a question of identification, identifying one horizon with the other horizon. Um, the entanglement entropy between the two black holes is proportional to the smallest area and a cut through the Einstein-Rosen bridge. There seems to be substantial um, evidence for that. Of course, before you can say there's evidence for that, you have to agree that there's a black hole interior. If there's no black hole interior, this wouldn't mean anything. OK, so that's what ER equals EPR is. And what it's, I, you know, I can go a little bit further. Let me, let me say something else. What about ordinary particles? Supposing ordinary particles are entangled. They have some bell pairs. I'll draw some bell pairs here and connect them if they're entangled. This is just a, um, a schematic uh, picture of the fact that they're entangled. They might be entangled in maximally entangled states. Is there any wormhole between these? Well, that's silly. Of course there's no wormhole between them. Nobody can jump into a particle and come out. Uh, well, you can't come out the other end. but. Um, but is there any sense in which we might want to say that there's a sort of proto set of wormholes between these two? And I think there is, in the following sense, that if we took these particles over here and collapsed them into a black hole, and we took these particles over here and collapsed them into a black hole, these black holes would be as entangled as these pairs. So if we have entangled pairs and we collapse them, we create entangled black holes. And therefore, we create by we create um, a geometry with a wormhole. So I would like to say, and Juan would like to say, that there's already a proto sense in which there are um, microscopic, super Planckian um, wormholes between entangled particles. But of course, if all we were talking about were particles, and we were not going to be collapsing them into black holes, there wouldn't be much meaning to this other than to say they were entangled. But if they are entangled and we collapse them, apparently, if this principle is correct, it makes black hole with wormholes. So the way I like to think about it is that when you collapse these, these strands or whatever they are collect together into macroscopic collections of them and form with wormholes. OK, so that's the, uh, that's the good news. Suppose there was only one pair of entangled particles? Well, then, it's a, then there's just a. Um, 
that in your imagination you can imagine they're connected by something, but there's no content to it other than uh, I, you know, I defy you to jump into an electron <laughs> and, uh, and try to find your friend at the other end. Okay, so that's now what's missing is a nice idea. It says that there's some deep connection between geometry and entanglement. But um, one of the things missing here, which frustrated me for a long time, is these bridges tend to grow. And they grow, and they grow, and they grow, and they grow. And they're formed. They may be small. But as soon as they start uh, sort of left to themselves, they will grow and grow for a very, very long period. I'll show you why this happens. But they will grow for a very, very long period of time. And it was totally unclear to me uh, from the point of view of, let's say, ADS-CFT, let's say the, the two-sided ADS black hole, which is really two black holes in the sense here, what it was in the dual description which was growing. I'll draw some pictures on the blackboard so you'll understand what I'm talking about. But what was it that was growing inside the, uh, the black hole here? What from the dual point of view was growing? What do you mean in the bulk? Is it growing in length or width? Yeah. No, not in width. The width is the, is the entanglement, mm -hmm. people, the length of it. Well, we'll work it out. Okay. And it grows, classically it grows forever, and its length grows linearly with time. Uh, what is it in the dual field theory, in the ADS-CFT language, what is it on the dual side, which is growing for such a long period of time? Black hole is thermal equilibrium. Two black holes entangled, they'll come to thermal equilibrium pretty fast, rather fast. Uh, so what's left to grow after a system comes to thermal equilibrium? I'm going to answer that question and show you, or tell you, <laughs> and show you, that there's quantities which continue to increase long, long after thermal equilibrium, and they're called complexity. All right, so the first, uh, the first part of this talk, I'll talk a little bit about what complexity is, what it really means. It's a technical thing. It's not a thing you uh, you um, you know you go to. Uh, <laughs> I won't say Santa Fe. Uh, you don't smoke uh, funny things and talk about complexity. Complexity <laughs> is a technical, technical subject. Hyper technical. I'll try not to be hyper technical. Um, it grew out of computer science, and especially the, the things that I'm thinking about grew out of quantum computer science. It addresses the question of how hard is a problem. Uh, or better yet, how hard is it to take a system and apply a unitary operator to it? Of course, it depends on the unitary operator. The more, the harder it is to construct a quantum computer or a quantum circuit that will create the state that you're looking for, the more complex it is. That can be quantified with some precision, and I'll try to do that for you now. Could you back up a second? I haven't got the words dual yet. picture. Uh, how do I visualize the wormhole? What, what do I think? Okay. Of so, um, well, I'll, I'll try to draw another picture. Take space. Space is very big. This is my sheet of paper. I'm gonna sort of fold it over like this. I've done nothing to it. Mm -hmm. I've done nothing to the intrinsic geometry, right? but just by, by uh, in the embedding space story like this. So let's take a very big space and uh, draw it like that. Okay. Black hole over here and a black hole over here connected like that. So you can go two people, one of whom lives over here and one of whom lives over here, can jump into the black hole a meet at the center at a time much, much smaller than the time that it takes to go around the geometry. What you can't do is you can't send a signal from one side to the outside of the other side. That violates what's called um, uh, non-traversability. And one of the reasons the wormhole is non-traversable is because it grows. It grows so quickly that you can't get through it. That's one way of describing what happens. Okay, so that's the that's the picture of what a uh, Einstein-Rosen bridge is. Discovered by Einstein-Rosen and uh, Einstein-Rosen. 
Incidentally, the two papers, ER and EPR, came out in the same year, 1935. I don't know what the, uh, somehow I suspect they were not thinking about this. <laughs> you know, who knows? Uh, good. All right, so let me talk about complex, I don't know how far I'm going to get, it really doesn't matter. Um, uh, let me talk about classical complexity first. So to talk about classical complexity, we need, first thing we need is a system. So let my system be a system of C bits. C bits mean classical bits, it's coins, heads, tails. They're either plus one or minus one. And um, so we have a system, and our system is zero, one, zero, whatever, whatever it is. Okay, that's done. Now we need, in order to talk about complexity, you have to start with a concept of what simple means. What is simple? All right, so what would you, what would you say is the simplest state that you could write down? Zero, 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 zero. I can say it with two words, all zero. Very simple. So let's say this is a simple state. It's, defini it's a definition, but it makes good sense. One, 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 one is equally simple. So in order to not have two simple states, I'm going to identify in the Z2 transformation, which flips everybody, I'll just identify the states so that I only have one simple state for, for the purposes here. Okay, next, simple states. Simple operations. A simple operation is one that involves a small number of degrees of freedom at a time. What's the smallest number of degree of freedom that an operation can act on? One. So the simplest kind of operation you can have is a flip. A flip means zero to one, one to zero. You can go anywhere in this chain of coins and turn one over. You can go someplace else, turn one over, and so forth. So we have the notion of simple operations. And now we have a task. In this case, the task is to start with a simple state and get to a other state, some other state. My task is to go from here to here by a sequence of simple operations. Question, what is the minimum number of simple operations that it take to go from here to here? That's the definition of complexity that I'll be using. The minimal number of operations that it takes to go from one place, to go from one state to another state. If the simple operations have been defined, and this is a definition, the simple operations have been defined to be a single flip, how many operations does it take? Well, you know how many operations it takes, just the number of things that have been uh, flipped. Uh, if, they, if this thing is of size k, then what is the maximal complexity? The maximum complexity, and this is an important concept, the maximum complexity classically for this system, for the, the maximum complexity is in this case k over 2. The 2 is there because I've made an identification under the z2, so the 0, 0, 0 is the same as 1, 1, 1. And but you don't have to worry about k over 2. How many spins do you have to flip to get to here? What's the maximum number of spins you have to flip to get to here? k over 2. So in this case, the maximum complexity is, uh, is k over 2. What's the maximum entropy? That's k log 2. So apart from some numerical coefficients, the maximum entropy and the maximum complexity are the same. Okay. Next, just fiddling around, it doesn't matter. It could be a deterministic rule. It could be a non-deterministic rule. How long does it take on the average? Oh, oh, there's another interesting point here. Almost all states are maximally complex. If you think about it for a minute, almost all states have about half the spins up and half the spins down. So almost all states are maximally complex. How long on the average would just pretty much take any rule, or it be deterministic, or it be random, how long does it take on the average to get from the simple state to the, to the maximum complexity? Not terribly long. Um, typically, I think it's a time of t max. I think it's also a time of order k, but I thought, for, I, I thought this morning that I remember it being k log k. 
sort of a card shuffling uh, story. See the K or K log K, and I don't remember. I have to ask Percy back home to see uh, the, uh, my advisor on these things. But that's a fairly short. It, K, incidentally, is a short time, it's a, it's a small complexity, it's a rather large entropy, even though the numbers are the same, it's the maximum entropy that the system can have. Okay, what else can you say about it? There's another time scale, which is interesting. This is the time scale for recurrences. Uh, there are two to the k states altogether. And so how long does it take when, you, by the, when you've gotten to this maximal complexity state, how long does it take before you're likely to get back to the original state? That's the recurrence time. And that's a order of the number of states, e to the k. So these uh, are various. You've introduced a new concept there, because before we were deterministically proceeding by trying to get to the maximum state in the shortest time. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Now I say suppose. Good, thank you. Thank you. The definition of complexity is the shortest path. Your dynamics may not take you there that fast. Your dynamics might just be some different dynamics. Uh, whatever your dynamics is, it will tend to recur after a time of order e to the k. Because they're just e to the k states, so if you're cycling through them, that's how long it'll take. Quantum mechanics. What about a quantum complexity? Do I understand, for example, the, the state 0, 1, 0, 1, 0 continued all the way We're going to call that, we're going to call that complex. Yeah. <laughs> By the definition, that's complex. <laughs> And that's how long it will take you. That's how hard it is to get there. So this is not depth. Okay. Is that what? I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. So now, any, uh, zero, one, zero, one, you can summarize in one sentence. Yeah, this is not algorithmic complexity. Right. This is computational complexity. Mm -hmm. How to get there rather than how to describe yeah, yeah. it. Uh, uh, algorithmic complexity, you can say, how long does the uh, program have to be? But then you can ask, how long does the program have to run? Mm. Okay, that's, that's the difference. And so we're talking about what uh, I think will be called computational complexity. I don't know, some of these words I made up, I don't know. But no. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not allowing parallel gates in that case? Because if you want to get to zero, one, zero, one, you can just have yeah. a long-term gate. Right? Yeah, but you'll still, that's right, you'll still call it complexity, the number of gates. Okay. All right. uh, now, I use that definition because that's the definition that the experts used in quantum mechanics. So what about quantum mechanics? All right, so again, we start with a system. The system could be the same system, except now they're qubits. They can be arbitrary linear combinations of states. The system is again, all right, but they can be an arbitrary linear combination of states. A state is now not a set of k by binary digits. Here the state was a state, a state was a set of k binary digits. A state now is a sum over i from 1 to 2 to the n alpha sub i, where alpha is a set of complex numbers, times mm -hmm. i, where 2 to the n represents the total number of states in a basis. Any basis you use, you'll have to specify 2 to the n complex numbers. Here, it was n binary numbers. How many states are there all together? Well, of course, there's a continuous infinity of states. But let me uh, cut it down by taking a very, very crude approximation. The crude approximation is the alphas can either be 0 or 1. How many states are there then? Well, each there are 2 to the, two to the k alphas. Each one can be 0 or 1. The number of states is 2 to the 2 to the k. Quantum states are just vastly richer than classical states. Um, to my knowledge, the first one who really pointed this out may have been Feynman. I don't know for sure. But Feynman explained in his famous <coughs> paper on quantum uh, computing, this is the reason that quantum mechanics is hard. It's hard because even to write down a generic state vector, you have to write down 2 to the k, uh, two to the k real, no, 2 to the k complex numbers. So that's uh, that's. You mean two to the two to the k? That's mm -hmm. what you meant. You said two to the k. You meant two, two to the two to the k. 
no, two to the k complex numbers, but if each complex number could be zero or one, then it's doubly exponential. Now here the number of states was already singly exponential. Here the number of states, the number of states is doubly exponential, um, but the number of coordinates that you have to write down. Good. Okay. Um, okay, what about what the, what uh, parallels these things here? Let's start with the maximum entropy. The maximum entropy for k qubits is just k log 2. That's the same classically as quantum mechanically. It tends to make you think, given this enormous amount of difference between quantum mechanics and classical, that there must be something awfully classical about entropy, and there is. Entropy is counting the number of classically distinguishable states. It's something very, very classical about the notion. What about complexity, the maximum complexity? Here, oh, I haven't, uh, I haven't told you yet how to define complexity, have I? So let me tell you how to define complexity. We need the idea of a simple operation. So you can say, well, operations in quantum mechanics should be unitary operators. <coughs> so let's say unitary operators acting on one qubit. Well, you won't get too much of the Hilbert space that way because you'll never make entangled states. If you're operating one qubit at a time, you cannot get to any entangled state, and therefore you've got to introduce something beyond single uh, qubit operators. The next more complicated thing is two qubit operators. And two qubit operators, they can create entanglement, and then they can spread entanglement. Okay? Uh, they can spread entanglement, and they can get you anywhere. So um, the picture then in quantum mechanics is a quantum circuit. And a quantum circuit means something like this. You have a collection of qubits and a collection of unitary matrices, two, of two particle unitary matrices, which you allow to act on the qubits. They start in an initial state, simple, and they act, and they act And you're allowed to do anything you want with them, as long as it's unitary. That's a quantum circuit. Question, what is the smallest quantum circuit that you can start with a simple state and get to the state psi? That's a property of the state psi. I just said, how, how many, cubi, how many uh, gates uh, are involved in going from here to here? Well, there are many, many ways to get from here to here. So it's not a well-defined uh, property of the state. But if I tell you the, the, the minimum number of gates that it takes to go from here to here, that's a property of psi. If you tell me what psi is, we can tell you what the, uh, what the minimum number of gates is. Very, very difficult to compute. That's called the gate complexity. It's called gate complexity, and that's the sense in which I'm talking about complexity now. That's the exact uh, concept of complexity that I use. So let's take that definition and compare that this over here. What's the maximum complexity? Not k over 2, but uh, e to the k. I don't know if it's e to the k or 2 to the k, or it, it depends on details. It's, it's exponential. It's exponential for obvious reasons that, um, that, the, uh, that the Hilbert space is so much bigger than the, um, than the classical uh, configuration space. Maximum complexity is e to the k. Maximum entropy is simply k log k. Now we have a huge difference between the classical concept of entropy and the quantum concept of complexity. They're enormously different. How long, I'm going to add another time scale in here. Another time scale is t thermal. How long it takes to thermalize? Uh, I haven't introduced any Boltzmann factor and so forth, but for the typical systems, how long does it take to thermalize? Um, generally speaking, the time to thermalize is a power law in K. For fast scramblers, it can even just be logarithmic or K log K. Um, in general, it's a uh, it's polynomial. It's a polynomial amount of time to thermalize. So the thermal time scale, T thermal, 
is not very big. K, K log K, K squared, depends on the dimensionality of the, of the system, uh, but it's a polynomial, thermalization. How about the time that it takes to get the max? Oh, and, and uh, in uh, classical physics, they're sort of comparable to each other. Thermal and the time to get the maximum complexity. How long does it take to get the maximum complexity here? Exponential time. It's exponentially long to get the maximum complexity. But how long does it take to get the thermal state? Well, it doesn't take exponential time for this room to, uh, to equilibrate. The answer is it takes polynomial time. So there's some tremendous difference in quantum mechanics between a state achieving maximum complexity and a state achieving thermal equilibrium. The history in a quantum mechanical situation of a chaotic system, with we're talking about chaotic systems, of a chaotic system evolving Oh, oh, yeah, and there, of course there's a maximum, yes. You said that the number of gates would depend on the state, but then in your maximum complexity, I don't see the state entering. Is there... No. <laughs> um, Where did it go? Sorry. That's the largest possible. Uh, That's the largest possible complexity. For any state. Overall state. Over any state. state. Oh, but there's another statement. And it's the analog, well, I don't think I wrote it yet. Almost all states are close right, to maximum complexity. Okay. Almost all states are close to maximum complexity. So the thermal states would hmm? only be, the thermal states would be? The states that you see if you th as you thermalize a system after a short amount of time are not that. They are not complex. That's the right, point. Right, right. That's the point. Complexity continues to increase long after thermalization happens. Now, all right, so here would be the history of a um, of the uh, complexity of a uh, of a, an interesting system. For long periods of time, of order e to the k, it increases linearly, and then. It hits this maximum, not relatively sharply, I think, uh, and becomes flat. Where is the thermalization in this picture? It's microscopic in here, you can't see it. It's too small to see. So thermalization is a very, very rapid process. Um, complexification, if you give it a name, is a very, very long process. Reaches the point where there is some essentially maximally complex state with you know inner product one of the root two of the state. So, so, so I mean this is just flushing out your comments about nonlinearity. Oh. Um, so you know it takes a very long time for the state to become complex, yes. but it takes I think a much shorter time for it to become such that there is some maximally complex state which has inner product that's probably true, something like that. Yeah, true. And, yeah. And that, that probably must be down yeah. microscopic in the yeah. sense as well. Well, that's right. Yeah. yeah. A question? I think that's right. Uh, so um, okay, so we have this concept of complexity. And we had a question that went back to ER equals EPR. I told you before that Einstein, Rosen, Bridges, these things behind the horizon, they can't be seen from outside, they grow. And they grow for a very, very long period of time. Ask the question, what in the dual description, the quantum mechanical description, is encoding that growth? What is the quantity in the dual description that grows for long, long periods of time that could be a candidate for the growth of the Einstein-Rosen bridge? So now, I could ask you, but I'm sure you know the answer. But what I was to say, you know, you know what I think the answer is. <laughs> the answer is complexity. So I'm going to show you now um, what we know from the geometry side. Yeah. Uh, so there's also a concrete recurrent strain even in quantum mechanics. Say it again. There's, oh. a, there's a recurrent strain even in quantum mechanics, which is like level spacing, which is again exponentially. That's e to the, e to the k. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's much larger. Good. Just to yeah. make sure. Right, very much longer. Yeah, that's because there are e to the e to, or two to the e to the k right. states altogether. Right. So if you're walking around in this um, on, uh, 
mm -hmm. on CP, two to the K, whatever it is, mm -hmm. this is uh, how long it takes to get back to the neighborhood of the, mm -hmm. that you started with. Right, so quantum and Poincaré recurrences are a very long time. So maybe this is too early to ask this question, but you were saying that, of course, we expect that classically the black hole um, bridge grows for a long time. Yeah. Are you going to explain why you think that the time that it grows is e to the k as opposed to e to the e to the k? Oh, oh, no, no. It didn't. Well, the first thing is complexity will grow linearly for a while. This is uh, to um, to follow the detailed reason for that. Look up Michael Sidman. There's a very wonderful paper on this subject where all this complexity stuff is geometrized. Not this is Einstein geometry. It's Michael Nielsen, mm -hmm. the famous uh, uh, quantum computer person, famous uh, who uh, gave up his job and said that he was going to hire somebody, uh, hire Michael Nielsen. And he did some wonderful work on the subject. From his work, you can conclude that for at least some period of time, the complexity growth is linear. Okay. And I'm actually making an assumption here. I'm assuming that it stays linear for as long as it can. When, how long can it? Is the transition sharp? Yeah, in Nielsen's description, the transition from one behavior to another is sharp. Uh, it corresponds to cut points in, um, in, uh, in geodesics. Well, never mind, we won't do that now. I'll, I'll tell you about it later. Tony? Yeah. Uh, it seems to me that the question of you know, how long this uh, Einstein Rosenbridge grows. Yeah. It's very slice dependent. <laughs> oh, it's so smart. Okay. So, I, mean, I, I always, you know. Well, that's where we're going now. You're going, you're going to that's exactly where we're going now. Okay. We're going to discuss nice slices, which is a term that was invented by Joe Kolchinsky, although he says it was invented by me. <laughs> <laughs> I think it appeared in a paper we wrote, huh? Yeah. Um, take any. Geometry and without any space time geometry, one that has decent properties. We want to foliate it. We want to foliate it with space like slices. And we want them to be nice slices. And by nice slices, I mean, first of all, they should be Cauchy surfaces. They should cover everything. Every time my geodesic should go through it once and only once, and uh, etc. And number two, in order to keep them nice, I want to keep them away from singularity. Okay, away from the singularity and away from regions of high curvature. <coughs> So I'll show you a construction now, which uh, I would have thought that this, you may tell me that this is a known construction, and that, that would be fine, but, uh, but I didn't know it. OK, take your space time. Now, this is not a Penrose diagram. This is just, a, this is r equals 0. There's a sphere far away. This little sphere far away in, in ordinary space. Go far away, take your sphere. Far away means asymptotically. There are asymptotic clocks out there, so you can keep time in an ordinary Lorentz invariant uh, way. I've actually picked the Lorentz frame, so these clocks are at rest in some Lorentz frame. And now do the following. <coughs> Take a surface. This is a surface, and we draw it another way. This is a sphere far away. This is a sphere far away. And now I'm just filling up space with the surface. Choose the surface of maximum volume. Now, it may seem a little strange, maximum volume, but that's a, that's a, that's a Minkowski uh, funniness. Uh, if you try to make it longer, you end up making it shorter. You know what I mean? Stuff that like, like. Maximum surface. Now, what will that be? You want to be a flat space? Those maximum surfaces. And, and then foliate. Anchor the surfaces way out far away and then take the maximal slices. Those maximal slices will clearly foliate the flat space, and they will just be the usual, um, if there's gravitational waves or anything else, and they wiggle a little bit, but that's about all. Let's take a black hole. I'll show you what they look like. Incidentally, these surfaces always seem to exist. The reason that they stay away from the singularity is because at the singularity, the sphere shrinks to zero. It shrinks to zero faster than the other direction expands. So volumes tend to get small near the, uh, near the singularity. 
So in, in, um, in doing the variational problem, you're finding maximal slices. They tend to stay away from the singularity. They will tell her not exist for the inflated region. What's that? They will tell her fail to exist if there's an inflated region. That's right. That's correct. Right. You can't use these for the sitter space. It's one word for the sitter space. Well, wormholes that the sitter is curious. All wormholes are good. That's probably right. Yeah. So, so this is a nice geometrical construction, but is there something else that makes them special to this story? Um, you know, I don't the maximal I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. The, the, the property that had one property that I didn't mention, which is important, is that the gauge invariant or coordinate invariant, yeah. the geometrically defined. Yeah. Now I'm sure that if we, if we had some other construction, we could examine it, and I suspect it wouldn't be very different. My guess is my guess is this is not terribly uh, special. Um, there may be better ways. This is just a way. Right. So what I look like, let's draw a, uh, I'm not going to draw a Schwarzschild black hole. It's, it's fine. It's no problem with Schwarzschild black holes. I'm going to draw an ABS uh, black hole. One sided. Let's start with. No, let's draw a two sided first. Let's draw a two sided. The eternal, the eternal black hole. And anchor the surfaces at time t on both sides. That's just a convenience. We could uh, we do other things with it. Anchor the surfaces there. The one that goes to the middle here, whoops, I didn't quite get to the middle, but that's just going to be an ordinary, that's just going to be the ordinary t equals zero surface. And as you move up, they start to look, well, the first thing you can do is go to t equals infinity. That's the outside time that you can go to t equals infinity. And t equals infinity, they have a nice property of having a symmetry, sort of translation along the, um, the killing vector here. You can calculate them very easily for any black hole. And they look about like what I've drawn here. They are sort of midway, or not exactly midway, between the singularity, some, some microscopic uh, distance from the, from the horizon, but nowhere near the singularity. They look like that. And as time goes upward here, these things start to hug the, we'll call it the final sluts. They start to get closer, I can't draw it well. They start to get closer and closer to the final slice. This is called the final slice. And I, uh, here's where I was going to use colored chalk. Box it right here if you want. Yeah. So I <laughs> the final slice is green. The slices as you move up start to hug it closer and closer for longer and longer distances. And incidentally, the final slice has infinite length. It has infinite length. And as the slice moves up and up, it gets longer and longer and longer. And all of the lengthening takes place near the horizon here. It's as if, well, all of the lengthening takes place in this region here. Most of the rest of it is kind of frozen. All right, so what does an embedding diagram of this thing look like? The embedding diagram of this, so, there are two sheets of space, this point to that point. And at t equals zero, you have a short wormhole with the horizons touching right over here. The horizons touch right over here. And now you start moving upward. And the wormhole as defined by the Einstein-Rosen bridge as defined by these space-like slices here. It's longer and longer and longer. Well, that bound. It just keeps growing. Or at least classically, it just keeps growing. We don't really know what happens quite mechanically. I think we actually do. No, we don't know what happens. But I think we can say, you know, that a quantum mechanical black hole is a system of a finite number of degrees of freedom with a finite entropy. It means there's going to be Poincaré recurrences. 
So very, very long times, it's quite clear that, um, that we can't trust the classical physics. But for long times, we trust the classical physics. The Einstein-Rosen bridge gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And this is its embedding diagram. And it's just, yeah, OK, so that, uh, that's, what about a one-sided black hole? So if you were to say how long we can trust the classical physics, what? I can tell you what the maximum time was. OK, it's this. I think it's equal to this. I think it's equal to this. Yes. Yeah. In other words, this break here represents a breakdown of, uh, of uh, I believe, of classical geometry. But, but when you say that, you're basing it on this conjecture, or there's an independent bulk reason to say Oh, it's a con that's it. Um, wait, sorry. That it breaks down at that by that time, I think, is, uh, is uh, uh, almost certain that, uh, that by the classical recurrence time, you know, elephants will come out of a black hole. So, um, uh, so I, I don't think there's any chance yeah. that, uh, that nothing funny happens by that time. Certainly by this time. By that time, the system will return to its initial state. Classically, there's no possibility for doing that. So it's got to break down somewhere. So. The, the idea that, that lasts as long as I'm saying, that's a conjecture. That um, no uh, cut point, no cut locus occurs, whatever it is, and something or other, something or other, until you reach this point. That is a conjecture. Um, good. OK, one other, one other diagram I'll draw. I'm going way over time. This is a one-sided black hole. A one-sided black hole means just a black hole, a single black hole in a pure state. A single black hole in a pure state is not entangled with anything. So it should not have an Einstein-Rosen bridge. But it does. But it's a bridge to nowhere. You've seen pictures of bridges to nowhere. <laughs> you go on, drive out on them, and you come to an end. Right, so let's, let's draw the bridge to nowhere. Here's the horizon. Here's R equals 0. Here's R equals infinity. Now we start down here, anchor a point over here, and draw the maximal slice. It's just an ordinary slice. It stays ordinary. By the ordinary, I mean APS slice. Until you get up to the place where the matter may have originated from that created the black hole. That's the matter that creates the black hole. And as soon as you go past that, it starts to get deformed. Again, at infinitely late time, there's again a final surface. And again, the, the slices start to follow that surface. And they follow, they hug it closer and closer and closer and closer. And the only growth of the thing takes place over here. As time goes up, more and more of this final surface is exposed. And so what you see as an embedding diagram would look like this. Down here it's flat. Now it gets a little dimple in it. And the dimple starts to grow. It grows and grows and grows and grows. Incidentally, if matter falls in, it gets swept along with growth. If a particle falls in, then in this picture, everything is swept along with growth. And the informing matter that created the black hole is all frozen down here. That's uh, it's frozen down near the end, near the uh, far end of the einstein rosen bridge. And it's sort of swept off. Now, swept off doesn't mean it's going anywhere. It means that this is stretching out. If we, if we um, hold this fixed, then what's happening is the horizon is moving away. If we hold the horizon fixed, then the um, this object here. Okay. For this construction, what's the minimum radius? It's dependence on dependence on m. Sorry, uh, this minimum radius surface that you hug. Oh, how does that depend on m? On which? On, on m, the mass of the black hole, or the original radius of the black hole. Yeah. Oh, how? Well, what is it? What do you want to, do you want to know the Schwarzschild? Is it is it just a factor or is it a power of r? Well, it's a power of mass. 
Okay. So it's well, as well. But yeah. that, that power tends to go, it disappears out of almost anything interesting. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, you want equations, I'll show you equations. But uh, the equations are, are uh, this is what it looks like. OK. Oh, and incidentally, the length of this thing is equal to t. Uh, 2t in the case of a two-sided black hole, just t in the case of the one-sided black hole. So it grows linearly with time. It's inflating. In some sense, it's behaving, it's, it's growing in a way that's sort of reminiscent of an uh, inflating geometry, but it's inflating linearly. And it's all happening, all the stretching is happening near the horizon. That's the picture that you should have in your mind. OK, now, what is it that's growing? What is it that's continuing to grow long, long after the black hole is achieved thermal equilibrium? Like this, that was growing in complexity. All right, so let's, uh, let's see if we can relate the complexity to the volume of the einstein rosen bridge, defined in this way. And I, I, I think you're probably absolutely right in what we're asking is it was it really absolutely critical to define the surface in precisely this way. One other question about this. So there's a, I, I think a known statement about these kinds of slices, and that is the lapse goes to zero in the future. Sure. So that means that the evolution of the stuff, you know, far down the throat is basically freezing from this point. It is frozen. Yeah, it's, it's completely frozen. frozen. Well, yeah, so you know, is you that wait this long? mechanically or not? If you uh, wait this long, yeah. No, wait. It, this that makes long. it look like you have no more evolution except near the throat where it's. Yeah. It's but if you wait part. this long, yeah. it will start spooling back up. Uh, wait, oh, the, one of the exponential times. But yeah, yeah, okay. So it's not true that classically, I mean, that quantum mechanically gets frozen. But before that time, it's acting frozen. Well, I think, I think at least the degrees of freedom. In some sense I think by this time, it's doing something um, crazy. Okay, before that. Oh yeah, yeah, that's, that's it's behaving like most of the degrees of freedom were frozen. That, oh, that's a little strange yeah, yeah. from the point that of view. That frozen yeah. more That doesn't mean something can't move upward. For example, if somebody falls in and they're over here and then they shine a laser beam, oh, they're, they're, yeah, they're in behind the horizon, and then they shine a laser beam back out. Okay. What does that look like? Well, what it looks like is the laser beam tries to get out and then turns around. So temporarily, you can have things going against the flow. Well, no, I mean, it depends on, uh, depends, on, depends on the details. It can almost get right up to the horizon with enough energy, with a uh, high enough energy particle to get up close to the horizon, but it will fall down before it passes the horizon. Yeah, we know where it ends up. It ends up somewhere on the singularity. We don't want to play with this, but well, okay. See, okay, look, when it when it crosses the max, when it crosses the final surface, it crosses the final surface at a point which is infinitely far from the horizon. So somehow it turned around and uh, went off to infinity. OK, so that's, that's a picture of what's happening to the Einstein-Rosen bridges. And the claim is that it's connected with complexity. All right, so let's, uh, let's uh, talk about trying to calculate. Let's see, so um, let's see if I can uh, give you a rough idea of the connection between complexity and the volume of this thing. First of all, I want a very simple theory of complexity and how it grows. Here it is. What's the slope of this line? Uh, you know, I'm not sure if I'm going to go on and uh, we'll stop in uh, any kind of line. Um, no, this is kind of crucial, right? Yeah. Hmm? This is kind of crucial. This is of course. Yeah. But, but, uh, you know, people can only leave. People can leave. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so I want a simple theory of complexity. There is a simple theory of how complexity grows, at least 
as long as you're on this linear and increasing place. Okay. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm skeptical of this linear thing in the first place. Read, uh, read the... Um, no, but I, I'd like to know what's known about this for Hamiltonian systems. Yeah, the computer scientists like to think of you apply gate after gate after yeah. gate. Yeah. And this is not how Hamiltonians work. Right. You exponentiate a Hamiltonian right. and it's right. all right. gates at once appear. That's so, what Niels' paper is about. Okay, and it claims... Yeah. And you know, I, I don't want to do that now, but I'm, okay. I'm happy to do it afterwards and to show you what, uh, what what's involved there. But yeah, have faith. That's what you think in your whole thesis of logic. You're not allowed to pull the thesis. You're not allowed to play the thesis advisor card. <laughs> <laughs> but we know that Hamiltonians are special because they're local, for example, and usual field theories. Well, we can talk about this. <laughs> yeah. We, you're absolutely right. We should be talking about Hamiltonians. And Hamiltonians can be related to uh, quantum circuits to something called trotterization, but let's not, let's, uh, mm -hmm. this, is not, uh, this is not central to what I want to say. Let's assume it's all okay. All right. What, what's the slope of that line? How fast does complexity increase? So I'm going to make a very simple guess. And the guess is the. Uh, uh, I guess. My friends, business companies are like this. All right. First of all, the complexity is extensive. Mm -hmm. If you have a system twice as big, it will get, let's well, suppose you just have two disconnected systems so that uh, so the system is twice as big just because they're disconnected. Uh, the complexity as a function of time will be twice as big as for one of them. Just, you're just counting gates. How many gates are uh, <coughs> happening uh, per unit of time? So we expect that complexity to be extensive. And what does that mean for a black hole? It means proportional to the entropy. The number of, uh, the number of active degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, in this language over here would be the number of qubits that are necessary to describe the, uh, the black hole. So first of all, it should be proportional to the entropy, which, as I said, is just a measure of the number of active degrees of freedom. Now, how fast are the interactions, how fast are the operations taking place in the real Hamiltonian, whatever the real Hamiltonian is, that, I think, depends on the energy. Basically, the number of interactions that a little subsystem will have for unit time is essentially the energy per subsystem. Okay. Temperature. The temperature is the thing which governs how fast things happen in the system. So the simplest guess, which does turn out to be right, on this branch over here, is that just that it's entropy times time. Now, we have a black hole. The entropy is a geometric quantity, it's area. Let's write this as the complexity after a certain time is S times T times time. I'm doing, I'm doing a, 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 I'm not cheating, I'm just doing an overly simplified calculation here, just to show you how it works. The complexity after a certain time is S times P times T. Okay, S is area divided by G. The temperature, the temperature depends, well, the temperature contains a factor of square root of G naught naught. What is that called, a Tolman formula or something? But um, there'll be some factors of square root of G naught naught in here. This time here is coordinate time. When it's multiplied by the appropriate square root of g naught naught up in here, what this becomes is the proper time along the, uh, along the surface. So proper time, let's just call it uh, t, I'll leave it as it is. And the temperature to have the right units, it has to have LABS in it, downstairs. Now, this A here is the area of the bridge. The T is the length of the bridge. Remember I told you that the length of the bridge is proportional to the time of the uh, what's measured. A times T is the volume of the bridge. Area times the length of it is the volume. That's the volume of the bridge. There's one more factor, which I only discovered fairly recently. There's another factor, and it's the dimensionality of space-time. For that, you actually have to do a calculation. 
Everything can be done. You can calculate these things. The assumption here is that you know how the complexity increases. Once you say, once you know the geometry, you'll find out that the complexity after a time c is volume times some numbers, hmm. ABS. Well, this is an interesting formula. It tells you that the, uh, that the complexity, if you believe it, it tells you that the complexity is proportional to the volume of the Einstein-Rosen bridge. What about Schwarzschild black holes? Well, Schwarzschild black holes turns out are exactly the same. Well, I mean, Schwarzschild black holes in, empty, in uh, flat space. It's C is equal to the volume of the bridge, dimensionality of space, G, but there's no LADS, just the Schwarzschild radius of the black hole. That's the, um, that's one form of the connection with complexity. Okay, so should I go a little further? Yeah, we can we break for cookies if you come back and continue with okay. smaller group. All right, all right, yeah. Yeah. let's do that. Yeah. I'll show you other interpretations of the complexity which have some interesting properties and a connection with the size of the Einstein-Rosen bridge. But in any case, the message here is that we're mapping, we're mapping highly quantum mechanical properties, quantum mechanical properties that are you know, deeply quantum mechanical, this, uh, these properties over here, we're mapping them to geometric properties of the interior of the black hole. That's the goal. So they are mapping from geometry to the, to the foundational properties of quantum mechanics. Okay, so can I take a break? Yeah.